Easter's coming up. Maybe it's time for you to gift a Bible to somebody, or maybe it's time for you to replace your well-loved Bible. Either way, I get the question every single day, what Bible translation do you recommend? What Bible should you get? So today we're gonna talk about the best Bible. Let's go, let's begin, it's time. If you're watching this video, you may have watched Bible review videos. I'm going to be completely open and honest with you here. I am not a Bible reviewer for a very important reason. I do not watch Bible reviews. I am not about the paper thickness or the type of leather or the way that a Bible is bound. That I'm just, I don't care. One thing that you may have heard of are premium Bibles. I really honestly don't understand those either. I do not understand why anybody would pay more for a Bible because Bibles, should get worn out. <laughs> you know, no matter what they're made out of, it's gonna be something that wears with time. All of that to say, today we're gonna talk about translations, we're gonna talk about use, we're gonna talk about like the space and everything. But my prayer through this video is to take you outside the box. I'm just giving you a spoiler. The boxes will be taken and thrown out. They will be recycled. First off, as a seminary student, let me just let you know, just right off the bat, there is no perfect. There is no perfect translation. And there is no perfect printing of the Bible. You know, solid KJVers. I love the conviction and the support for the KJV, but if you're human, you gotta admit there are flaws with the KJV. I currently read the ESV. That's not for any particular reason, but I will tell you that is because translations are not cut and dry, black and white, like people may like to put it. In fact, I would be cautious of anybody that says, this translation is a horrible translation. I've said this before and I will say this a million times more. More often than not, people disagree about things in Christianity, like Bible translations or baptism or women in ministry for very good reason. If something is debated, I encourage you to lean into why is it debated? I have never regretted leaning into why is there a discussion about this? Nothing is ever as cut and dry as people may like to make it. I will just leave it at that. Bible translations are a spectrum. Because we are translating the Bible from ancient Hebrew and Greek, and we are putting in modern day English terms. For example, English was like different 50 years ago than what it is today. We're gonna come in contact with issues. We, for example, do not use thou and thoust anymore. If I'm like some TikToker, I am not gonna understand what thouist means. There's a degree to which our view of translations and our view of what is necessary in translations is always evolving because culture and language is constantly evolving. There is a sense to which that is true, but there's also a huge important point to the fact that we want translations to be faithful to the scriptures and faithful to the original text. As someone who has studied ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek, I will let you know just right off the bat, there is not a one for one translation. Let's say in Greek, this word means past tense, masculine form of running. When we translate a word, it might be like three words when originally it was one word. That's common for any language, right? Give yourself a little room to just try on different translations and see, hey, what makes the most sense. When I was in middle school and high school, this is when I wore this Bible fin. This is NKJV. I struggled through it at some points, so maybe I could have possibly used a different translation, but that's okay. I still learned how to read a harder translation. Then when I graduated high school, my Southern Baptist church at the time, which I'm no longer in the Southern Baptist denomination, but I take no fault with this. They gave me the NLT. I had never read the NLT. That was kind of more of the modern, understandable for young people kind of translation. And I originally liked it because all of a sudden scriptures were making more sense to me. And then as I got into Bible college and now of course into seminary, I learned to not so much like it. I didn't like the way that it was translated on particular passages. And when I mean particular passages, I didn't like how one word was translated in like 5,000 words that I had read. When we make differences in translations, it's always very nitpicky stuff. People love to cast translations in lights. Like this is the bad stuff. This is the good stuff. As if every single verse is skewed by that translation and more often than not, translations are super similar. But all that to say, translations are on a spectrum. I've made a video about this. I will have that longer video linked at the end of this video. Just as a quick summary, on the spectrum of translations, there are translations that try to be more one for one. So they try to be as literal as possible. For instance, if I was to grab this interlinear off my bookshelf, I just opened up to a random spot. This is Acts 12. We see here's chapter 12, verse nine, Kai. Kai is the Greek word for and, so then it has the English and. Having gone out, so that is the past tense, the 
E looking letter there is added on with the apostrophe, but the core word is right there in the center. The W looking letter and the V looking letter were added on, that's part of the ending. You know, so that is the core Greek word, but we translate it three different words. You could go for a literal translation and let me just read that verse for you. And having gone out, he was following and had not known that real is the thing happening through the angel. That makes no sense. There are literal one for one translations, but they're not gonna make a whole lot of sense. And in fact, they might make you assume that they're saying something that they're not actually saying because it doesn't make sense, because it's not more realistically translated so that you know what it's trying to say. The problem with translation though, is translation in a sense leads to interpretation. Translations like the one that I read, ESV, translates words that could mean male or female as always male when referring to, or I think always, or more often than not, as male when it refers to ministry. And so texts that may seem explicitly male in the Greek are not. They could be male or female. Translators, without even meaning to, will often put in their bias or their preconceived ideas into the translation by just trying to make it make sense because literal one-for-one -one translations are not always gonna make sense. So this spectrum of scripture, you know, there's the literal on this end and there's the very contextual on this end. And you want to be somewhere in the middle or at least just be aware of the spectrum. But there's a little correspondence and there's the dynamic equivalent. I want you to just be aware, no matter what translation you pick, just be aware of like, this is very literal, but it therefore might be hard for me to actually understand and interpret. But if I choose something on the dynamic equivalent end, I might be taking the interpretation and missing the very just literal core meaning. So you want to be aware of where you're at or pick a translation somewhere in the middle. Now on top of this, people will always ask me, you know, how many Bibles do you have in your Bible library? Why do you always take all of your Bible notes in your one single Bible? Do you take this big chunky note crazy Bible with you to church? And I'm like, yes. I teach out of this when I do Bible studies. When I go to the local high school and I lead FCA, I teach out of this like, this is my everything Bible. But that does not mean that I don't have other Bibles on my bookshelves. So right here on this shelf is where I keep my Bibles. And I just took my old Bible off of the shelf, but you will see I have Bibles here. None of them are ones that I write in or I take notes in. I am not the type of person to take notes in a bunch of different Bibles because I want to have one main go-to Bible so that all of my notes are there and it's not like, oh, where did I take that note about John 12, you know? But here, these I use as resources. So these are different translations or different study Bibles with particular notes that I wanna look at. For example, the NKJV Cultural Background Study Bible is here. This is a Bible that I use almost like a commentary. So if I want cultural background notes on a particular text, I will pull this out. It helps that it's in another translation so that when I'm pulling it out and reading the notes, I also have another translation to read and to feed off my ESV Bible and they can help each other. They often give me another way of understanding the scripture, but it has more cultural background information given from a very worldly anthropologic worldview. It's not coming from a biblical worldview. Another one is the archeological study Bible. I have the Reformation study Bible, the Sheverd's Truth study Bible, the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. That's a really helpful tool to use when you're trying to look for cross references. And the Dake study Bible, you know, so I am not someone that says you can't have other Bibles. Bibles. I do think that there's a point in a usefulness in having other Bibles as tools, but be careful not to fall into the collecting and worshiping of things. And what I mean by that is among the Bible reviewing, among the premium Bible, like cool excitement and stuff, there can become the sense of where we have to remember we are not saved by our fancy Bible leather. We have to remember that the number of ribbons in your Bible binding isn't gonna save you or isn't gonna really truly like change your Bible study experience. It's not gonna make you closer to God. No, the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, is within you. Romans 8, 38 through 39, nothing can separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you are a believer, God is going to work through whatever translation you choose, whatever leather your Bible's bound in or lack of leather. So I would really encourage you, and I've been meaning to say this on my channel, but I have not yet said this even though it's really necessary. Please, 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 please never spend more than like, let's say 50 bucks on a Bible resource unless you cannot find a used or cheaper option. Please do not fall into those lies. That is thinking that there's some kind of monetary boundary between you and the Lord and you 
understanding God's word better. And that should not be the case. Like for me, when I'm personally buying books online, I typically use Amazon or eBay or whatever. I have this general rule of thumb that I will not spend more than 25 bucks on a book unless I can't find it anywhere cheaper, like on eBay or whatever. The moment you put a price tag on stuff, I mean, this is why I don't love selling my courses on the book of the Bible. The reason why it really took me a long time to start charging people for my work is because it's like, there should be no barriers. So do not fall for the lie that some Bible is better because it's hundreds of dollars. Because what you will do is you will not end up reading them. You'll be too afraid to dive in and take notes in them. You won't be in the word because you'll be working a couple extra hours at work to pay for your next Bible or whatever it is. Ask yourself, what Bibles do I have sitting around the house that I could start marking up? What Bibles do I have gifted to me that are here readily available? I encourage you stop collecting Bibles and start thinking about how can I actually use my Bibles? How can I wear out the binding in my Bibles and use and use and use and inhale them, consume them because it actually is the word of life. I told you I was gonna tell you the best Bible and you probably got the idea of where I'm going with this. There is no perfect best Bible. There's no best translation. There's no best or you know most useful leather or ribbons or any, nothing, none of that will save you. There's no perfect Bible because there's no Bible explicitly made for just you. And the reason why there's no Bible made for just you is because God has made himself in you. He has put himself, the Holy Spirit within you, living inside of you, convicting you, teaching you, guiding you in your Bible studies, whatever. There's no perfect Bible or perfect Bible translation because there is no limit. There's no barriers to our good God. I want you to think back to your early Christian self where maybe you took like one single verse for the day and you would take it out of context and run with it and you'd live off of it for like two months. You'd be like, this is my favorite verse right now. And you were like totally taking it out of context. God used that in your life, even though you were totally taking out of context. So trust that God has already placed the right scriptures in your life because it's alive and it's working and it's there already in your life. No Bible that you buy, no amount of money that you spend on any special books or anything is ever gonna save you. They might enhance your Bible study, but that's it. You still have to read them. You still have to search. You still have to pray and ask, Lord, come meet me. And God is still gonna have to jump off those pages for you because we cannot save ourselves. We are completely and utterly broken and in need of a savior, not in need of the perfect translation, but in need of a savior, not in need of the perfect Bible binding, but in need of a savior, not in need of the perfect Bible resource, but of a savior. Now, this is not everything. There's so much more about Bible translations that I'm leaving out because I can only make so long of a video. So click right here and watch that video about translations. Don't miss any bit of the goodness. I'll see you guys in that video.